If you open your Bibles to uh, the book of Acts, chapter 9, In Acts chapter 9, we start with the story that Saul was breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And this young rabbi is so, has so much initiative that he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So if he found there any who belonged to the way, notice the Christians have been called the way, because in Christianity you are constantly moving. You cannot be still. You are either going forward or you are going backwards. If he found any from the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. You remember in the book of Acts in the beginning, Jesus says to the disciples that what happened in Jerusalem must travel away from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the last part of the earth. People say that whatever happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. But whatever happened in Jerusalem must travel away from Jerusalem. Now Saul is not happy that things travel away from Jerusalem. Now they are in Damascus, that's another country, that's Syria. It's on the news these days, so you know where it is. And he decides to bring them back to Jerusalem. He wants to bring the news back, but he can't do that. And so he stopped on the way. In verse 4, at end of verse 3, near Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Notice twice, twice, like Abraham, Abraham. Something significant, something important. Even Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you persecute, he replied. You see, Saul is not happy about this group in Judaism who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And of course, the Jews in first century believe that if Messiah comes, that will be the end of the eight age. Then there will be seven days silence, and then the new age will start. Now everybody looking around can see the old age is still here. People are dying, people get sick, the old age is here. So if these p disciples say that Jesus is a Messiah, obviously they are wrong. And he believes that this dangerous innovation is going to destroy Judaism. And so he persecutes them. But here's the problem. Saul kept the right day. He kept the Sabbath. He believed that people don't go to heaven when they die. He believed in the mortality of the soul. He did not eat unclean meat. He paid his tithe. He was waiting for a Messiah. And that means he was a Seventh-day Adventist, wasn't he? Because he kept the right day and he waited for the Messiah to come. But here's the problem. He's a disconnected soul. He's on the way to hell. Why? Because he demands that people change. If people believe differently than he does, he sees them as enemies, as a target of his missionary zeal. And he can ask them to change without giving them something. If they don't see his truth, he becomes so angry, so upset, that he's even willing to persecute them, and if needed, to kill them. And that's why he goes to Damascus. Outside of his sphere of influence, by the way, it just would look good on his CV. Prove his zeal. But then he stopped. And from a proud, resourceful, powerful, and 
proud, arrogant individualist who persecuted the church, suddenly we see rather helpless Paul who needs being led by others, by somebody else's hand, totally dependent on others. And that's where we pick up another story that we read in our scripture reading in verse 10. And I want you to concentrate on this one for a few minutes. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias, verse 10. The Lord called to him in a vision and said, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on the straight street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Ananias can hardly believe what he hears. Lord, did you say Saul? In verse 12, in a vision, Saul has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. The Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Verse 14, and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Notice this, Saul is not in Damascus yet and Ananias already knows why he's coming. These early Christians have good intelligence. They know what's coming. And he says, Lord, I know who is this Saul. He is the persecutor and destroyer, the enemy of the church number one. You can't possibly ask me to go there. And interestingly enough, remember when Moses in Exodus 3 has so many excuses why he can't do what God asks him to do, God enters into a dialogue with him. Now here, verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go. No discussion. Do you remember growing up? As a little boy when I said frustratingly, but mom, why? Because I said so, and I am your mother. <laughs> that was the usual answer. And God says to Ananias, go. And so Ananias goes. He goes to the straight street in Damascus, and there, just as the voice told him, is a man called Saul. And Ananias comes, and listen to this. He addresses him not as a church enemy number one, not as a murderer and a destroyer as he truly is, but he addresses him, Brother Saul. Wow. Not only that, then he lays his hands on him, as we did on Mark and Olivia, and he ministers to them, to him. He becomes a priest to Saul. And when he lays his hands on him, Saul's sight is restored. He's able to receive food. And the change is so dramatic that this man who was called Saul of Tarsus now will receive a new identity. And from now on, he will be known as Paul. For us in Christianity, Saint Paul. Poor Ananias. Try to imagine how he must have felt. Unfortunately, we will never know. You know why? Because we never hear about Ananias again. He evidently went back home about doing his business, having played just a small bit his part in this drama of Christian conversion. But without his part, the conversion of Saul would have never happened. Imagine what would happen if Ananias said, Lord, I don't mind little evangelism. I don't mind that some new people join our church. But a murderer? 
You must be kidding. You don't want me wandering down straight street and risk death on the basis of some guy's religious experience? And I would not have blamed him. Ananias must have had some friends, if not even close family members, who have been put to prison or even to death because of efforts of this man, Saul of Tarsus. Ananias didn't wish him any harm, but why should he wish him any good? When you think about this story, that makes you ask, actually, who had the most dramatic conversion in this story? Is it Saul? Or is it little Ananias? Because when we speak about Acts 9, we always remember the dramatic conversion of Saul. But let me humbly suggest to you that probably, however dramatic that conversion was, from enemy and persecutor of the church into the apostle of Gentiles, he is not the one who has the greatest conversion in the story. It's the little unknown, insignificant na m man named Ananias. Ananias, who on the basis of nothing else but the voice and vision, risked his life, went to the street called Straight, and addressed once a bitter enemy by the tame term brother. Touched him laid hands upon his head and was to him the agent of the most dramatic transformation in all the scripture. And that makes me think, you know, if I have been forgiven, if I have been connected to God already, then I have his spirit poured into my heart. He gives me life. And then another human being cannot pose threat to my existence. Yes, people can still reject you. People still can hurt you. They can even make your life pretty miserable. But they cannot destroy you. And Ananias realizes this, that Saul is no more threat to him. Therefore, he can go and do for him, for Saul, what God did for Ananias. I can go and do for you what God already did for me. I don't need to allow my fear, what you might do to me, how you might treat me, to control how I treat you. And if you are still afraid of connecting with people, you are more like Paul before Damascus than Ananias. Let me tell you a little heresy of mine. It seems to me that God could not convert Paul sooner than he got an Ananias converted. Is it possible that God was waiting to get someone to go and treat Saul the way Ananias did, because that was the difficult part. God could have floored Saul much sooner. That was not difficult. God could achieve that easily, knock him off his horse, shower him with the light, show him his power, and say, you are not as powerful as you think, Saul. But how do you convince a Christian believer to treat nicely someone who thinks differently than they do. That's the difficult part. And you know why I think so? Because the way Saul responded, who are you, Lord? And that moment when somebody says to him, the voice says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He realizes, uh-oh, this Jesus is not dead. Those stories that he was resurrected are true. 
But when he says, why are you persecuting me? That tells me he did not treat me the way I treated his followers. He could have treated me the same way I treated his followers, but he didn't. And when Jesus says to him, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, in verse 10, Saul immediately says, what shall I do, Lord? In other words, now when I know that you are alive, I will do whatever you tell me to do. And you know what is God's response? Go to Damascus. You will be told. In other words, you have many things to learn and many, many to unlearn. Why did Jesus not tell him what he was supposed to do? Because you know Saul. Now with the same zeal, he would go and persecute those who don't do what Jesus told him to do. And that's why Jesus says to him, I am not going to tell you what you are supposed to do. It's going to take you years to figure it out. Until one day, this soul is going to say in Romans 14, some people give for a day, some people don't care for a day. Some people do it for the Lord, and some people don't do it. Let every man, let every person be convinced in his own mind. Can you imagine Saul saying this before Damascus? He, in the name of God, would persecute, exterminate, kill anyone who thinks differently. But now, Jesus says to him, go to Damascus, you will learn. You will need to learn that religion is more about connections than beliefs. And who can show you better this than Ananias? Because he was accepted and changed by God, now he can extend the right hand of acceptance and fellowship even to Saul. You see, being God's people is not so much about right doctrine. Remember Paul believed in Sabbath? Paul ate proper food, he paid the tithe, he was waiting for the Messiah to come. But being God's people is as much about right connections, relationship, being a community of connected people. If our relationships with people are determined by fear, we are still disconnected. And how do you know that people are disconnected? Because they demand. They demand that people do rather than care for them. And so we demand that people study the Bible. We demand that people witness about their faith, that people eat at least as healthfully as I do that people keep the right day as we do. Of course, the right doctrines are important, but remember Saul had the right doctrines. The problem is that right doctrines alone will not produce connectedness. It did not for Paul. If I, if we demand from people rather than give them something, offer them something, we are disconnected like Saul before Damascus. But if I realize that I have been accepted by God, then actually I can accept, just as God accepted me, other people. When you offend me or hurt me, and let me tell you, Living in this world, even with saints, somebody is going to offend you, somebody is going to hurt you. I can still nourish the spirit of forgiveness because I have already experienced it. God forgave me. 
I may have had to look hard for it. It might not be the most natural reaction, but it's deep down in my heart. Because God treated me that way. I know how it feels. And because God cared for my needs, I can now care about the needs of people around me. I can pour into your life that which has been poured into mine. Because how God treated each one of us. You see, when we are converted to Christ, we have been forgiven and we have been given the task to forgive and to care because God cares for us. Why did he stop Saul on the road to Damascus? Because it was his son. He cared for him. A father says to another father, if I had a son like that, I would have renounced him long time ago. And the father replies, I would have done too if he was your son. But remember, he's mine. God sees even Saul as his son. And he cares about him. When we are converted to Christ, we are not simply converted to loving Christ. That's not the end of the story. We are commanded to love those whom Christ loved. Loving Christ is easy. He has been nice to each one of us, forgave our sins, fulfills our needs. It's loving those whom Christ loves where the rubber meets the road. Because they can be sometimes so obnoxious, just like so, just like you, just like me. Living with some of us, it's not easy. But because God's love is always reaching out, always grasping, holding our lives, changing others, bringing lost sheep into the fold, once we realize what God did for us, we can do that for others. And that's why Ananias can go to Saul and not only show him transforming love, by calling him brother, but also ministering to him. When we pour into others, one another, the little lives that has been poured into ours, connection happens. Something changes. Reconnection takes place. A disconnected soul begins to draw close. Suddenly courage develops. Hope appears. And we press on with life, eager to receive more, to give and share this connectedness that we can provide it to others. Instead of being his worst enemy, Ananias can call Saul my brother. And maybe this is the test of fellowship. Can you call a brother or sister those whom Jesus considers brothers and sisters? Or do we still perceive people as liberal, conservative, left-wing, right-wing, fanatic, black and white and redneck and this or that, which is brothers? sisters and notice who did it Ananias not some kind of spectacular Christian who could preach marvelous sermons teach astounding lessons his name is never mentioned as one who was close to Jesus either before or after his resurrection just an ordinary little person who appears in the story and then disappears, making his small yet big contribution. A small person making a big impact. So here's the lesson. Jesus 
does not hesitate to ask ordinary little people to act like Christians. Here's the lesson from the story of Ananias for me and for you today. Jesus, even today, 2,000 years later, asks ordinary people like us that we treat others the way he treated us. To be a disciple of Jesus means taking ordinary, everyday people and turn them into courageous people who are able to relate to others in the same way that Jesus relates to us. Jesus chooses his disciples among ordinary people. He just turns them all around. Discipleship means taking ordinary, everyday people and turning them into extraordinary people who live counter to the ways of culture in which they are or the world in which they live. Because if you attack me, the most natural response is the best defense is the offense. Attack you back. But Jesus counts that he will have people who will treat others as they have been treated by God, not by others. And for that, you don't need a degree in theology. You don't need a degree, a doctorate in counseling. You just need to relate to others the way God related to you. And I tell you that as someone who has a doctorate in theology and a postgraduate certificate in counseling, because this is something that I am not good at. And that's why this story speaks to me so mightily. That's why I was touched by it. Discipleship means taking ordinary, everyday people and turning them into saints. Like Ananias. Being able to do for Saul what nobody else could do for him in that community. So let me conclude. You too are called to connect. You too are called to see more than mere humans struggling whose worst fear is that you will see them as strugglers afraid there is nothing deeper in them than their sin and fear and pain that that's all there is to them no they are children of God created in his image because if you only see sin and pain their only hope to be accepted is to sin less and to show that they don't experience pain. How are you? Oh, everything's great. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. While the heart is crying. You too are called to connect with people so that you can see that there are created in God's image. Because if you only try to figure what's wrong with them and what they should do, that will only confirm their fear that their only hope is to do more right things. And any psychologist and musician will tell you the more frantically you try to do something, the worse it gets. And that will never produce what God or you and I are looking for. God is calling you and me to connect. And that means more than to be nice and say, oh, don't worry, I will pray for you. It means more than just hug you or to put your head to my chest. It means that when you see people full of doubt and self-hatred, that you will be filled with anguish as Jesus said, cry with those who cry and hope. Hope, not empty hope which says, just hang in there. 
Surely you will so feel better soon. But hope that exists there because you see something planted in the heart of that person by God. Jesus says to Ananias, this man is my instrument. And that was true about Saul. That was true about Ananias. And that's true about you and me. This man, this woman, is my instrument. Why? Because you too can be Ananias for someone else.